Hi, it's Tom from MyCare Eyewear, and today I wanted to just discuss our optometry services. The presentation I'm going to talk about would be introducing our practice, the scope of practice that we have, some common referrals that I often see from doctors, um, and some investigations that I like to do um, with those particular type of referrals, how I report my findings, and a couple of other things that I'd like to mention too. So to start with, um, my qualifications include a Bachelor of Applied Science in Optometry, a Master's in Business Administration, a Graduate Certificate in Ocular Therapeutics. I did um, optometry when the course was separated, and so now most optometry graduates have that extra qualification, and a Fellow of the Australasian College of Behavioural Optometrists. My memberships include Optometry Australia, the Orthokeratology Society of Oceania, the Australasian College of Behavioural Optometrists, and ProVision, which is my professional support um, practice the group that I use. So iCaro was founded in 2006, and we have a practice in Dolby and Chinchilla. Our slogan is Professional Eye Care and Innovation in Eyewear, and recently we did an analysis of our core values, and these include clinical excellence, patient focus, teamwork, and professionalism. Recently, we have been lucky enough to have three new team members join us. Uh, first is Joe Stower, who's an optometrist, who's going to work with us in Dolby on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, jo is a Dobby local, so it's really exciting to have her um, working with us now. We've also got Nat Sleeman and Kristen Plumpton, both um, experienced optical dispensers and also vision therapists. So we can now offer this in both Chinchilla and Dolby. So just to summarise, our optometry consulting days at the moment include every second Monday and every second Saturday in Dolby, and also Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. And in Chinchilla, I consult on Tuesdays and Fridays. A lot of information you can, can be found uh, about our, on our website too, which is www.ecw.com.au. So when you think about optometrists, it's very common for optometrists to do assessments of sight and ocular health and prescribe spectacles and contact lenses. Um, because of uh, being fortunate enough to be in a regional location has enabled me to work on the secondary components of eye care, and these are on non-referral based obviously. So things like the therapeutic um, or non-surgical eye disease um, management and um, management of eye trauma as well. I also do a lot of co-management with ophthalmologists and helping them with their post-operative care as well. And this has been great because it means a lot of our patients, mutual patients, don't need to travel back down to Toowoomba and Roma and Brisbane, etc., for different um, post-operative um, uh, care. I also like to f uh, fit specialty contact lenses, which includes orthokeratology and scleral lenses. So orthokeratology is the type of lens where you, it's an overnight lens that you sleep in and it reshapes the front of the eye and enables people to see clearly without glasses and contact lenses. Scleral lenses are, um, are larger um, diameter lenses which vault the cornea and create an artificial um, uh, clear optical surface through which people can see. So if there's any problems with irregularities with the cornea such as problems like keratoconus or um, post Corneal, um, corneal graft patients, then they often benefit from these lenses. Also really good for people with really severe dry eye as well. I also like to often perform visual efficiency and visual information processing assessments. So this is where I assess how well the eyes point and focus on things, and then subsequent to that, how well the brain processes visual information. So these particular assessments, while can be applicable for all patients, are really good for, say for instance, children that are struggling at school. And following from this, we often have a a program called Vision Therapy, which is basically a movement-based activity which is visually directed, um, where we develop visual skills, such as binocularity, how will you focus, how will your eyes can point, and, and your eye control, um, lots of other sort of skills we can develop with Vision Therapy. I also have a special interest in dry eye treatment too. So we have a special device called a blepharostim, which is where it's, there's some goggles with a heating element in them which heat up the surface of the eye. And after that, I'm able to express the myobomin glands, which has been shown to improve the flow of the myobomin glands, which often helps for um, for for, for, dryness, uh, for for patients to suffer from eye dryness. So, just as an example of um, a common referral I have from doctors would be a diabetic for a diabetic assessment. And I'm just going to talk about the things that I'll do a little bit differently in this assessment compared to a normal optometric assessment. So, an example would be they'll always have a dilated fundus exam using. Um, some sort of dilating drop, so trypophamide here, and that will make the pupils quite large afterwards, makes it a bit harder for them to drive afterwards. Um, we'll also invariably always do digital retinal imaging, so as part of our pre-testing regime, people can come and have an autorefraction and use the, um, the our special scanning machine to take photos of the front of the eyes, but also do the high resolution scans as well. 
And um, all diabetics will be um, will be billed the, the code 10915, which is our optometry item code, which mandates us to provide a report to you at the end of that. I like to use the International Clinical Diabetic Retinopathy Disease Severity Scale. And this um, spans from no apparent retinopathy, which is, un which is fortunately the majority of patients that we see, to mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, with, um, that means they have ERMAs, which are intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, moderate meaning they've got lots of these things, and severe uh, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy means they might have some um, intraretinal hemorrhaging and some venous beating and some more of these microvascular abnormalities, and all the way up to um, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And by that stage, uh, most, people, most people with those problems are managed by ophthalmology. Another example would be a, a driver's licensing assessment. So the part that I fill out is part three of this form, and I have a stack of these forms here. These, from my understanding, are for people that have a, a medical condition which is permanent or long-term long and is not, um, ca cannot be improved by wearing glasses. So basically, it's my opinion about their vision, and this is done for you to be able to make a decision as to whether this person is able, was fit to drive. Some of the conditions that I might uh, recommend would be um, uh, restricting their speed to 60 kilometers per hour, no highway or freeway driving, um, driving at night or um, only during daylight hours, and within 10 kilometer radius of the home. So I'm really happy and comfortable with uh, red eye assessments too. So um, Clorsig is great, but sometimes it doesn't solve all, all the problems. And in those cases that we can't fix it up with Clorsig, um, I'm happy to, to make some assessments. So obviously it's really important for me to check their vision, check tonometry to make sure there's no changes to the eye pressure. Um, having a high eye pressure may be an indication of, say, closed angle glaucoma. Low eye pressure may be an indication of some sort of anterior uveitis. It's nice to be able to track these things. I'm happy to use some um, fluorescent sodium to check for epithelial defects. Um, all our slit lamps are equipped with anterior segment photography, which enables me to take a photo now and compare that in the future, and then I can really see how the treatment is progressing. I've, um, fortunately, as I mentioned before, therapeutically endorsed, which means that we can prescribe um, the antivirals, antifungals, and some anti-inflammatories, steroid eye drops, etc. Another common referral is for headaches. So um, obviously, there's lots of different types of headaches that can be caused by lots of different things, and I was premise any recommendation that I make on the basis of a headache that there's all other nasty headaches that may need to be investigated. However, when you think about 70% of every all our sensory inputs that um, is, is visual and 40% of our cerebral cortex is responsible for visual processing, it sort of makes sense that um, patients that are under some sort of stress from their eyes are more likely to have some headaches. So an example would be like a, for instance, school-aged child that's having frontal headaches, maybe some reduced attention and academic performance issues. Um, uh, the sort of um, interventions that might, they might benefit from would be some near support lenses. Another interesting um, uh, um, area with headaches is with migraine, particularly visual aura, because this is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And we often find changes with people's macular um, cell density, so it's really good to do some, some assessments with that with our OCT or scanning machine. The, as I mentioned, the treatment options for this would be support glasses, but another option we have is an FL41 tint. So this is a special type tint which we can apply to glasses, and not quite as evidence-based as some of the other areas of optometry, but I've definitely had some success with people with that particular tint as well. Great for people with um, other things, other conditions like um, benign essential blepharosplasm and uh, other sort of conditions as well. And finally, as far as conditions are concerned, which are really common as far as referrals, would be flashes and floaters. What we're really looking for is a retinal detachment, and fortunately, they're quite rare. One in 10,000 people per year are going to have a retinal detachment. However, 66% of adults over the age of 70 are going to have a posterior vitreous detachment. So that's where the vitreous pulls away from the back of the eye, and it's quite common for them to have those flashes, and, and sometimes, more likely the floaters, but sometimes the flashes when the retina is being tugged by the detaching um, vitreous. So the statistics were suggested about 33 to 46% of patients with a retinal tear or a hole will develop retinal attachments. It's really important to pick those ones up as well. And just to note, it's 6% of these location is going to be the superior temporal quadrant, which means that the patient's going to notice it coming up from underneath if they have a retinal attachment occurring. So my um, management phase would be obviously to do some check the vision using pinhole as well. I'm definitely going to do a dilated funders exam. Obviously, use all my digital retinal imaging and organise referral. 
if needed, and if not, I'll just review them because there's some research that suggests it's good to review people with fighters at least um, four to six weeks after the initial presentation. So just an example of some of the equipment that we use. I've got a, um, a Silicon camera, this one just behind me here, and, and this enables me to take some great photos. So an example of this top photo here where I took a photo, this is the same, this is a patient, um, right eye and left eye, and she had LASIK in one and not the other. And you can see here that the tear film is actually breaking up, um, and that would be an indication of her having some problems with dry eyes, and just as happens to be in the eye that has had LASIK surgery. Down the bottom is some photos of a foreign body that are removed. Um, so yeah, I like to take photos when people have foreign bodies removed because it enables me to take a, a baseline record of what the eye looks like in terms of its levels of, of information, and if there is an infection that develops, we've got a baseline measurement there. We also have a optical coherence tomography in both our practices, this or OCT. This is where we take a photo and also a high um, resolution scan of the macula and the optic nerve, and this enables us to, the great thing about this, this device is we can, because um, it's part of my pre-testing regime now, so I, we always take these photos and when a patient comes back in, I can pull up all these images and track to see if there's any changes occurring with the um, topography of their optic nerve, um, the density of their, say, ganglion cells in the macula, and it's a really good um, subtle way of detecting changes like that might be in, moving in the direction of glaucoma or macular degeneration. Corneal topographer, there's no one just behind me here, is um, a, a favourite tool of mine as well. This is where I'm able to take a, a, a topographical measurement of the front of the eye. This is invaluable for in the fitting of custom contact lenses uh, and also for monitoring things like pterygium growth because obviously that can affect the topography of the surface of the eye as well. So it's a great tool that I like to use. And automated perimetry, um, this is where um, we assess the patient's side vision and um, they've got to concentrate on the spot. It's not exactly the most reliable test, but it's a really good test for um, assessing the end stages of glaucoma. So we still obviously like to include that one too. So when it comes to reporting, um, I make a concerted effort to do a report at the conclusion of every single consultation, and I share these with patients electronically. Um, I use media such as um, um, email and also Facebook Messenger. And because of all the images that we're taking, I'm also able to share these if requested um, or if they're clinically relevant. And the way that I can share these with you is with medical objects or with email with the patient's consent as well. So a couple of other things that um, I think would may be of interest to you as far as the things that we do. Um, corneal foreign body removal, happy to do that. Um, fairly recently, optometry was allocated a provider, a um, item number um, where we can do uh, we can, uh, the patients will get more back as far as a rebate um, with this item code, so that's been great. Um, another um, common thing that I will do is remove people's eyelashes if they're having problems with misdirected eyelashes. Um, bandage contact lenses is a really um, an underrated, um, underutilized area in optometry as well. So when a patient has some sort of, say for instance, a corneal injury and there is no sign of infection, then you can place a corneal lens over the top and it really um, helps with the um, epithelial healing of the cornea and because there's no constant contact with the top eyelid over the cornea. It's really great for pain management too. Patients are much more comfortable in that situation. As I mentioned, really comfortable with co-management arrangement with ophthalmology. Um, also, uh, I'm happy with seeing infants and geriatrics. I've got a... Um, um, some equipment which enables me like a portable autorefractor and um, a, a portable setup where I'm actually able to travel for, for patients. I have done some nursing home visits before as well. I wouldn't say that low vision is a massive part of our practice, but I definitely have some um, magnifiers, um, illuminated handheld magnifiers, which uh, I can definitely solve a lot of problems as far as people with low vision as well. Um, I mentioned the dry eyes and finally telehealth. So I um, had dabbled with te telehealth. We actually have our online booking system is has is telehealth enabled as well, which enables patients to for this service. Um, I have used uh, Messenger as well with for telehealth. There's a this slide down here you can see is an example of some co-management I've done recently. This patient actually has a choroidal neurovascular membrane, which is adjacent to her optic nerve head, and this is, would be typically managed in an ophthalmology setting, but because of her age, she's, she's struggling to get down to Toowoomba, 
and I'm taking these photos for and reporting back to the ophthalmologist and the neovascular membrane has starting to resolve, which is great. Fortunately, it's no any hemaculus that's on the site threatening and she's really happy with that management. So I want to thank you for all your support. Um, if there's any questions that this video has, um, has generated, please feel free to get in contact with me. There's my contact numbers. And yeah, if there's any, uh, yeah, really appreciate all the help and support that has been provided previously for our practice. And hopefully we can continue to help you in the many years to come. Thank you.